Welcome to the Talent Equation Podcast. If you are passionate about helping young people to unleash their potential and want to find ways to do that better, then you've come to the right place. The Talent Equation Podcast seeks to answer the important questions facing parents, coaches, and talent developers as they try to help young people become the best they can be. This is a series of unscripted, unpolished conversations between people at the razor's edge of the talent community who are prepared to share their knowledge, experiences, and challenges in an effort to help others get better faster. Listen, reflect, and don't forget to join the discussion at thetalentequation.co.uk. Enjoy the show. Well, I have a returning guest this week, David Hinchliffe, cricket coach up in Scotland, braving the weather. Welcome back. Thanks, you. Yeah, good to be back. Sim- summer's over. It was a good summer, actually. But um, yeah, we're, we're, we're definitely into autumn now here record number of games played i imagine oh fantastic so many runs scored it's unbelievable i was looking at it today we we're having our, our end of season uh, sort of reflection over over the year and we, we had 1100 scored across the uh, club uh, that i coach this year so uh, that's a, a massive number of, of runs one guy scored 870 runs so it's uh, <laughs> it's been a it's, it's it's been a bumper season good for the batters not so good for the bowlers yeah, well, it's uh, <laughs> up in Scotland. It's always a bowler's game. <laughs> it's about, ta- about time the tables were turned a little bit, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Interestingly enough, um, a slight, probably a slight segue. I know you've got a list of things to talk about tonight, so we're going to get into those not long ago. But I was talking to somebody the other day, which is um, potentially a springboard for some of our conversation, I guess, who was tell- uh, it was actually a guy at work, and I was talking to him about, you know, kind of, the podcast and the focus I have around the constraints led approach and ecological stuff. And he was telling me he plays really, really passionate about his cricket. And um, at the risk of geeking out on cricket, I'll have to try and describe this to people who don't necessarily understand the game of cricket particularly. But Mm. um, he was talking about how difficult his team found it to play against spin bowlers uh, because they hadn't really experienced conditions that we'd had so far because we had very, very dry wickets, which are very conducive to the ball um, you know, spinning in the air, taking purchase of the turf, and then obviously moving in direction once it lands. And he said, but found it really difficult to score, not necessarily to survive, to stay in, but found it very difficult to score. And I was talking about how we might approach uh, tackling that in, in from the perspective of developing skill around creating kind of game-like scenarios that would challenge an individual's ability to score runs against a ball that is turning. And, and, and the different ways that we could do that. So, yeah, it was interesting how uh, there you are with a group of individuals who are kind of playing in conditions that are sort of similar to you would experience in, say, you know, India or Pakistan or somewhere like that. And we haven't got a clue in England how to play that kind of that kind of game. Yeah, it's, it is interesting that there is it's almost a fear around one specific part of spin bowling because spin bowling is not just how much the ball spins when it hits the ground it's how it's it moves in the air it dips it it drifts mm. the speed of the ball um the, there's a lot of things going on whether you, whether the ball's going up or down you know in terms of the uh the parabola of the ball that kind of thing mm-hmm. so there's a lot going on that spin bowlers do all the time really good spin bowlers do all the time but the one that the batsmen fear is the one that turns mm. that's the only thing that they fear mm. so it's I often think when it's when we when you're talking about playing spin with someone, I think it's more about your confidence level almost in the fact that you can you can deal with whatever happens and not think of this one thing because they're called a spin bowler. Everyone thinks well they've got this one tool available to them, hmm. which is making the ball spin. But actually, you know, making the ball spin, it's not just movement off the ground. So yeah, there's there's a lot more going on with just how much the ball turns when it hits the pitch. I, Although I. Go on. I'm not averse to putting stuff down on, you know, uh, net on nets um, floors to make the ball do weird things because that's, you know, that is if, if any if nothing else, it's off-putting for the batsman because he's got all this stuff to negotiate around. It's interesting though, isn't it? How um, because it's an experience that is uh, rarely uh, had by 
many batters in English in English conditions playing on you know largely relatively green surfaces that aren't particularly conducive to to the ball spinning. You know the 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 spinner's art, I suppose, like you say, becomes much more about flight. It's about um, you know changes of pace. It's about um, like you say, uh, putting revolutions on the ball that generate spin. I mean, quite a lot of spin bowlers are actually just very, very slow swing bowlers. Um, and they're getting yeah. more movement in the air than they are off the surface. Um, and, and then it's the one that, you know, kind of goes straight on that's the dangerous ball as opposed to the ball that actually does effectively spin. But what's really interesting is, is when you do see um, a combination of things, which is rare, I think, which is not just spin and turn, but also bounce and the ball mm. bounces as well. So it's, it's, you know, that I think that's what often scares batsmen because they so rarely see it. And that's the thing that then begins to put the, like you say, I think it's doubt in the mind around how they can play. I, I actually p- prefer the ball to turn quite a lot because for me, a ball turning means that I'm pretty confident of what it's going to do so I can play for that. What I don't like is when it's really subtle and the ball sometimes skids on, sometimes turns a little bit. That's when you, I find myself really in two minds. Um, a, a viciously turning ball and a bouncing ball for me is actually great. You can do all sorts of things and score quite freely as far as that's concerned. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, yeah. It, I, I do, I do think though a lot of it is, is the, the mindset of the batsman because yeah. they don't even often, I find that the batsman doesn't even seek out playing spin. You know, I've, I've said it before often I'll say, you know, let's play some spin today to, to somebody and they'll say, Oh no, I know how to play spin. <laughs> And actually, you know, you look at the league, you look at the top league wicket takers and seven, six of the top seven are all spinners. And you think, well, hang on a minute. Someone doesn't know how to. (laughs) I have to to say, though, um, just talk, you know, you've talked about nets and stuff as well. I mean, we're jumping straight in here, but, um, you you know, and I have to say, I find it um, a lot of what you we talked about at the before the season started. It's funny how as I've been like going through my season, I've been observing many of the things that you talked about in our previous episode, which I highly recommend everybody go back to listen to. We don't just geek out about cricket all the way through it, to be honest. <laughs> but um, uh, one of the interesting things about it was about, you know, people's uh, approach to practice or, or, or approach to, you know, kind of representative practice within, within cricket. It's, it's really kind of non, you know, it's like, it's like a, it's like no one wants to even consider that. They just, yeah. like like you say, go through the motions and do what they do. But particularly from a spin perspective. So, you know, uh, like most, um, most I suppose, uh, clubs, our nets are, um, you know, uh, AstroTurf. And they offer, a, uh, they do some weird things, but nothing like what a normal pitch would do. The bounce is far higher. Um, you know, uh, you, you do get turn, but it it's so kind of true that it <clears throat> any batsman pretty much can play the ball, play you off the back foot, almost regardless of what you do. So it's really easy for them to play it very, very straightforward. Then you bowl a bit fuller, then it's really easy to drive. And, um, and so I found, you know, it's a bit soul destroying bowling spin yep. in a net, but also as a result, I think batsmen find it so easy and so such a little challenge that they... Uh, it's kind of boring for them. They'd rather face the, you know, the kind of the fear inducing factor of somebody who's bowling a little bit quicker. And, and also because a spinner's generally, you know, you don't, don't get very many of your wickets through like bowling somebody or even through necessarily through court behind quite often it's caught on the boundary or your LBW or something like that. And of course, you know, these people just basically see a slow bowler, smash it and go, Oh yeah, that was six. Well, no, you were, you were, caught, <laughs> you were caught on the boundary, mate. No, it wasn't. It was six. I go, Oh, okay. Well, there you go then. So it's kind of interesting how creating representative learning environments in in those very artificial scenarios is is a never ending challenge for me. I'd say it is. It definitely is. I've got some practical things you can do there. Actually, if you want a couple of a couple of little things that you might uh, that you might like, I'm all ears. One is um, if you go to the local pound shop and just buy some one pound uh, doormats mm-hmm. and put them down on the on the pitch. Mm. the uh, the batsman can step on them because they're flat but they make they, they make the ball shower mats do the same thing they make the ball do some amazing things when they hit them so much, especially when they hit the edge of them so it requires the batsman to play the ball it, it's a lot more difficult to play the ball so it's a lot closer to when you're playing a spinner and instead of the ball just skidding on them and not turning very much 
yeah. suddenly you've got a situation where the ball might roll on the ground or bounce up in the air or turn dramatically or not turn at all because it misses the mat completely. Right. And suddenly you've got batsman's got to be really watchful and he's got to he's got to watch the ball and he's got to try and play it a lot more realistically. He's got to try and get to the pitch of the ball rather than just waiting for it to bounce and then hitting through the line. So that's a, that's a really simple, cheap, cheap way of doing it. You, we've got, I think we've probably got 25 of those doormats just sat in our nets, just, just throw them down every now and again to, to make people, um, to make people aware that, you know, it's not just going to be a matter of, Oh, I'm just going to go in and whack it. And the other thing that I do, speaking of guys who go in and whack it, who say that's six, um, we have a, an in-between one, which we say, that is an unknown. Uh, that's an unknown. All right. So it might have been six. It might have been caught on the boundary. We'll never know. But what it was was it wasn't a very it wasn't a very sensible decision because there is somebody on the boundary and maybe you sent it over his head. Maybe you didn't. But why give why even give him the chance to do it? Yeah. And so we kind of put them in a in a different in a different bin. We say, okay, well you did that you did that six times when you were in the net. Now. You may have been out zero times. You may have been out six times. We don't know. But the point is, why are you even giving the opposition a chance to, to, get, to get you out when you've got, you can make other decisions which are a lot higher percentage chance of success? Oh, I love that. I think I think both. I, I like the fact that there's essentially a, you know, like a, a task constraint there with the, you know, with uh, when you're challenging the decision around that's not a, a, a sensible shot, and then you've also got the equipment based constraints of the mats. I really like that. One of the things I, I experimented with this season is because um, uh, I'm obviously working with under 11s, and the vast majority of them are spending most of the time uh, flossing. Uh, and I'm assuming everybody <laughs> knows what, what the floss is. Um, yep. and, uh, and also, you know, obviously very, very into the whole Fortnite uh, craze that's going on. Um, and so uh, with the help of my uh, son, designed a series of um, Fortnite-based challenges. We actually have a full mm-hmm. game called Fortnite Frenzy. Um, but um, although somebody wrote to me and actually with a concept called sport night, which I think is a much better name. But... <laughs> it's a good name. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I'd love to think, I'd love to say I created it, but I didn't, but uh, I, I will, I will credit the relevant individual uh, when I can remember their name shortly. But um, uh, anyway, uh, but so we yeah, so we actually created a game form like that, but actually in, in the next concept, we inspired by the magic Academy guys uh, kind of created some kind of challenge cards. So I'd go along with like these, sort of you know fairly Heath Robinson cards and I'd lay them out you know so right pick a card any card and pick them out and then and they have a a fortnight challenge so for example if they pull out um that they've got sniper rifles then it means they can only hit the ball on the ground and they can only score singles in given target areas um if they pull out um shotguns then they can then they can only play big shots they have full license to play big shots but they can't act they can't block it and then if they pull out uh, or uh, automatic rifles or uh, assault rifles, then they have the option to do both. But that's, de- that's dependent. That's called by uh, uh, the coach at the time. So they've got uh, both choices. But it's just interesting. Just That was just to create this different focal point yeah. of a different batting challenge based on a particular behavior that you have to, you have to perform. Yeah, that, that, and that, in fact, that whole thing around um, computer games, sort of gamifying the, mm. that stuff, is is brilliant. You know, you sent you sent me that um, whatever the the prototype version of that was a while back. I That's think it's, right. Yeah, yeah. sounds like it's got a bit more uh, advanced since then. Yeah, um, but I tried that as well, and it's just the engagement levels are so high because <laughs> they're, you know, they're starting to make the rules up. Yes. Rather than rather than you saying uh, right, here's the rules. You you give you give them the rules, and but within ten minutes, they're saying, oh, can we do this as well? Or can we add this in? Or what about if we do yeah. that? And I'm thinking, yeah. this is brilliant. You know, they're because you know you, you, it's, it's engaging that creativity in them rather than just them just passively thinking, oh, I've got to do exactly what the coach says. When we played the game, um, the, the strategic element came through where they decided who, you know, which pair of batsmen went out with which characteristics in order to try and, uh, because, the, um, because the boundary got smaller like it does in Fortnite, you know, mm-hmm. the, the storm eye was closing. And also they had that, the element as well, the other element that really added intrigue was the RPG element, which was this, you know, they get like a bonus ball basically where the bowler calls that they're going to take their RPG, which means if they get somebody out, they get 10 points. 
but if they bowl a wide, they give away 10 points. So that adds real dynamics and pressure into their over. Um, so it's quite good. Yeah, it was quite an interesting ex experiment, one that I'll probably explore more in more detail. And I guess it's around just getting out of the idea of, you know, I, I think I don't know if it's the same with lots of sports, but certainly with cricket, there is a there is a certain way of you have to do it in a certain way because, you know, that's the way we've always done it. And it's, you know, it's not cricket otherwise. It, it, it is, a, there is a isn't phrase, it? isn't there? It's not cricket. So <laughs> it's not cricket. It's yeah. an amazing, it's an amazingly traditional sport in that respect, though. And, and interestingly, one of the other things I found is, is that how kind of coaching as a concept in cricket is still really relatively in its infancy. I think, you know, so much is still done by the mm. captain or the players or kind of self-directed. I'm not saying that's necessarily a bad thing, but the role of the coach, I think is still quite undefined. I mean, I'm still finding myself having conversations internally within, within my club, particularly about how a coach can contribute. And it's almost sli slightly, um, uh, what's the word? I'm looking, slightly skeptical, you know, almost like, Oh yeah, no, no, not sure about that. Or, you know, kind of very, very odd. Um, anyway, I could go on about that forever, but I know you've got a long list of things to talk <laughs> about. So let's just jump in with the one that's uh, on your mind most and, and see how far we get. Well, I guess um, leading on from that discussion there and, and thinking about how where coaching is, uh, it, it, I mean, uniquely in cricket, I think because of, um, because of the, the power of the captain, it is something which is which is different from many other sports, but I guess the role of the coach within, within a, a sporting environment and, and whether it is how close it is to teaching, because I've done a lot of stuff in schools uh, in recent months and I found myself saying a few times, and I'm still not sure whether this is right or not. So I'm interested in your opinion on this. I found myself saying, I'm not, I'm not a teacher. So don't treat me like a teacher. We do, we're here we're here for some sport we're here to do some sport and that means i'm i'm your coach i'm not your teacher and that's different and i i think it is different and i don't think coaching is teaching even though maybe on the venn diagram there is a bit of a crossover but i'm not convinced by my own argument so i wanted to get i wanted to get your opinion on it really and think to myself you know what where where is the crossover and, and can you say on a, on a big scale is coaching teaching or is it different well um, I think it's one of those things that is an ongoing debate I, from my perspective, you know, looking at the various bits of research, because I read quite heavy, I read quite a lot uh, of educational stuff, educational blog, bloggers and educational researchers and research papers on elements of education. And, and quite a lot of coaching theory is based on educational theory um, and, you know, and, and stimulated by the concept of, you know, how people learn and all those sorts of things. I think um, based on my my reading of things, I think coaching, depending on which, um, what's the word, word I'm looking for, depending on which kind of camp you're in and which stable you're in, I think coaching can resemble teaching mm. and teaching can resemble coaching um, depending on your methodology. So uh, what I mean by that is, so for example, uh, let's take nonlinear pedagogy, um, where, where you are, you know, largely based on a kind of an environmental ecological approach where you are, you know, mostly designing experience, learning experiences, practice, you know, designing practices, problems for individuals to solve, you know, which is much more akin to a guided discovery, guided exploration type approach. Now that, that exists in teaching and is advocated in many quarters as being quite a powerful learning model. I know entire educational systems, I was reading about this recently, actually, entire educational system systems that advocate such an approach, but there is a absolute, um, you know, there is some real people who are very, very anti that, you know, much, much saying, you know, very focused on it. It needs to be based on a foundation of knowledge. You need to have really good understanding of things before you can then build on and explore and discover. So I suppose what I'm trying to say is, is that I think elements of teaching can resemble coaching or can be like coaching and elements of coaching can be like teaching, depending on where you, where you come from. I would say the traditional view of teaching probably for me lends itself much more to being kind of fairly instructional and it's mostly based on a kind of cognitive psychological uh, viewpoint of you know knowledge is important um understanding about 
about uh, something is important as a basis for which you can then begin to develop further understanding of various things. That's, I would say, what the traditional view of teaching is. And I know not all teachers ascribe to that particular model, but I think that's basically where the traditional idea of teaching comes from. And coaching is increasingly, because we're working in such dynamic environments, moved away from that because as the research has begun to uncover this whole idea of um, actually in a dynamic, you know, um, ever-changing, complex landscape where you've got teammates, opponents, things happening and this, that and the other, that kind of information processing model might not really be equipping athletes to perform at the highest level. Therefore, we now need to move, move in a different direction. Um, and as that's happening, I think coaching is becoming increasingly less like teaching. Um, but Again, like I said, I don't think it's a hard and fast rule because there are quite a lot of teachers who will be listening to this podcast saying, hang on a second, mate, we're very much in that camp ourselves. So, But I'm just basing this on kind of generalized views of what teaching and what coaching might begin to look like. God, that was a long ra- rant, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so do you think uh, uh, you could sort of, if you had the right kind of teacher, do you think you that you could almost... Um, unaided and move them into into coaching and say and say apply the apply the principles that you're applying and you won't you won't go far wrong you might not have the necessarily the technical knowledge or the knowledge of the game but if you apply the principles then the the you you'll still get what we're looking to achieve yes because i think um teachers in general have an understanding or a very very high in-depth understanding of children and children's behavior and uh, assuming we're coaching children here um you know and and mechanisms by which to foster you know and motivate you know young people to engage in subject matter which you know often is not particularly exciting to kids so you know the best kinds of teachers can do that so if you imagine you take somebody who's capable of taking you know pretty uninteresting subject matter and make kids really excited by it and then you put them into a context like a sports context and and then you know they use those same skills and apply them you could imagine can't you those those individuals are going to be really excellent pedagogically um Although uh, my challenges and what you've made me think of is, is that uh, Danny Newcomb, who's been on the podcast previously, has been working extensively with um, or has worked in the back behind the scenes uh, with colleagues at Oxford Brooks and a couple of other people to develop this sort of movement, movement literacy type program. Literacy is probably the wrong word. He'd probably slay me for saying that uh, called Boing. And um, it's based on ecological principles around young people developing movement competence through games, but those games in requiring them to solve problems using various forms of equipment and various tactical decision make decisions they do together. And it's a very problem based learning and towards movement learning. And they found it really difficult to get schools to engage with it initially because the predominant view of how children develop physical literacy is based on a very linear model in the curriculum. So I think a lot of this is based on the environment within which teaching occurs and the curriculum that's been created. So the curriculum often says that, you know, you must do these activities. Sometimes those are games uh, and you must, you can demonstrate movement competence by, and it's quite, quite clearly described what those movement competencies are and so what they do is they take people through this linear journey of developing those movement competencies what boing has said is you'll observe those movements but the way those movements will develop and observe is through the the young people participating in these games and solving problems which will require them to move in these ways but that's completely you know the the teacher can't get a head around that so it's an example i think of how I think pedagogically teachers are capable of doing this, but they're, they're kind of very aligned to a um, sort of, you know, kind of a, a curricular model that is, that is driven by technique and then the application of technique into whatever context you're going to do so. And I, and I, and I think that's where some of this stuff breaks down. So maybe just expanding on that from what you're saying there, it's if you have if if you have a curriculum that sort of leans you more towards that needing to tick the boxes of what's in the curriculum, uh, whereas generally speaking with um, 
with coaching, you don't necessarily have that. You don't necessarily have, I mean, you can, but there isn't necessarily a, a stand, a set of standards that you say by the end of it, you know, you need to be able to do these things because that's not what, where the test is. The test is in cricket. You go out and score runs or take wickets or catch the ball when it goes up in the air to you. So it, it's almost like it's the curriculum itself, which is, which is, uh, pushing people more a- away from the non-linear style of doing things, do you think? Well, interestingly, yes, yes. But I think this, there's also a cultural legacy in coaching from that, which is, if you think about coach education, um, that has traditionally been, certainly from that kind of technical perspective anyway, um, you know, driven by a technical curriculum. Yeah. That is, you know, there are techniques to the game that must be learned in order for the participant to be successfully able to participate in the sport. And learning those techniques is paramount. Um, and, you know, whether that's done explicitly because the sport has said these are the techniques or it's been done, it's not necessarily done explicitly, but, um, you know, if you like, if you think about it, coaches often come to sports with a technical curriculum in mind, you know, and the amount of times I've been on coach education courses in hockey where people are saying, but if you can't do the basics, you can't play the game. And I say, are you sure about that? And, and and because I've got experiences of exactly the opposite, you know, you've got no information whatsoever, whatsoever kids, apart from you need to use this stick in this way, because otherwise you're contravening the rules off you go and play and woe betide if a game of hockey doesn't break out. And, and so, (laughs) That's based, so, you know, the, the, the concept of, I've been talking in, in depth about this, is that, you know, if you start from, right, here's a bunch of techniques, we're going to build them up and eventually you'll become a cricketer. Or flipping it around and saying, what's the game of cricket asking you to do? Right, what might be appropriate movement patterns to be able to achieve success within that game based on the problems it's throwing at you? That's just a completely different way of thinking that the vast majority, and, and it's interesting how coach education systems mirrored our uh, you know, kind of curriculum model in many ways. It took the same, and it was based on the same um, kind of, you know, uh, I guess philosophical um, or uh, psychological st- standpoint around, you know, kind of h- how we create human proficiency. I guess I, that I suppose gets you, it gets onto that point that I know you've been talking about recently, which is kind of like the, the sociological and the historical thing around that. And sport has been traditionally looked at as a, another subject, right? When it, in Victorian times, it was the muscular Christianity and all that side of things, wasn't it? It was another, it was a way to prepare people to, to be ready to work and, and fight for your country. And so you had a, it, it just fitted nicely into that, into the, into everything else. It's just another thing on the list that that you needed to tick off when you had uh, when you were teaching children how to do things. Yeah, and I think I think maybe I don't. I mean, my, I, it may be my bias. I don't know, but I think maybe sport is not really in that category as much as as much as uh, other things still are. Perhaps I mean whether whether it should all be wide open. I don't know, but maybe sport is gone off on its on its own direction a bit uh, a bit more quickly than other school subjects possibly uh, yeah i w- i would i would say still it is i mean well i even just um I think societally uh from a policy perspective um you know from even just from a kind of cultural perspective it's it's seen as frivolity and and often seen either one of two things it's either seen as frivolity so it's play um or it's seen as important but for other purposes so for example for the purposes of health or for the purposes of um life skills or you know like you say uh dealing with um you know leadership you know developing leaders and all those sorts of things you know and 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 i i felt that you know it, it's never fully been uh, understood as you know kind of an end in itself actually in reality you know play recreate recreation recreation uh, leisure um you know health 
all those other aspects. You add them all together and it becomes a pretty important thing, but it's never been viewed in that. It's kind of one or the other or whatever. And, and, agree, and I agree, never been seen as an important subject. I mean, if you just look at primary PE, you know, primary PE where there's an opportunity there to uh, encourage children to have a lifelong physical activity habit. And if you look at the, the, the amount of uh, physical education specialism within that primary sector, it's, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty limited. You know, you're, you're, it's usually a teacher taking it on as well as instead of it being central, you know, and the fact we have two hours of curriculum PE in primary schools and then three hours of, of sort of, you know, uh, out of curriculum time and the out of curriculum stuff is largely led by, you know, kind of coaches of varial various degrees of, 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 um, of ability then you know it, it becomes a sort of situation where you can sort of see sport is really like you say like you exactly say as an add-on it's not really seen as central even though there's wealth of evidence around physical activity and sport being really valuable from brain development being really valuable from the perspective of you know kind of uh, you know behavior academia all these sorts of things you know so even if you were just looking at it that it's valuable in terms of it helps them with the other stuff you know the more important stuff even that isn't being given enough credence so it's a pretty challenging scenario to be honest yeah, it is. And that's, that's one of the things that I've been thinking about recently, uh, maybe not even recently, maybe just, you know, over a long time is often you come across these justifications for for why uh, sport needs to be around, in, especially in schools. And I'd and you, you even hear it from coaches, you know, coaches saying things like, oh, it's very important that, you know, we need to build better people as well as as well as, you know, create uh, sportsmen and women. But um uh, often I think to myself, isn't is not the the sort of the, the joy of playing the sport, the intrinsic joy of playing, isn't that the reason why in the first place? Is that do we need any more just build any more justifications on top of that? And I know that maybe sounds a bit wishy washy and new age, perhaps, but uh, I'm wondering if those justifications are not doing sport any good because it's almost trying to make trying to fit it into a mold. Uh, or of something it, do, it doesn't want to really fit into because you know if you enjoy playing sport you enjoy playing sport for for playing sport not because it gets you fitter or you know get, it gets you out of the house twice a week yeah yeah exactly and and um i mean i don't know I, I, there's there's just that part of me that feels that um I was at a uh, conference um, while you were talking, it just popped into my head. I was at a conference um, last week and uh, it was a big summit run by an organization called UK Active and they kind of represent, uh, UK Active represents the whole sort of exercise and fitness sector. So all the big gym chains and, and what have you. And, uh, and they, uh, their chair is Tanny Gray Thompson, you know, the mm-hmm. Paralympian mm-hmm. Uh, and sorry, Dame Tanny Gray Thompson. And, um, she said something in her opening speech, which was really kind of heavy hitting about, um, you know, kind of young people particularly and the crisis that we face around things, you know, for example, obesity and increasing levels of inactivity. And they just produced this report called generation inactive. And, um, that one of the stats that stuck in my mind from that is, uh, she said children in the UK, so three quarters of children in the UK, spend less time outside than prison inmates hey everybody just wanted to jump in there to make a quick announcement as you're aware um john o'sullivan mark bennett and i are getting together in the new year um on the 5th of january um all with the help of uh, juan gonzalez mendia from sud america coaching uh running a uh, i guess I, I don't know when we're going to be able to do it again but it's going to be an event where we're getting together john's over here we're all getting together with some with a group of people and we're going to learn together do some live mentoring work through some issues do some presentations and uh, and if you want to join us and you want to uh, experience what will be a fantastic exciting event then uh, I suggest you get on board. All the details are on the blog. Uh, just go, go over to talentequation.co.uk and uh, you'll be able to find out how you can join us. It's basically a Christmas present to yourself. So um, look forward to seeing you there. That's quite a scary thing, isn't it? <laughs> 
and I was just lit. Like, you could hear it. I could almost like hear it like a pin drop. And it was like, and I was like, and I, it just came. And then this was part of a wider piece around policy and 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 the importance placed on physical activity from the perspective of health and all those sorts of things. And and the fact that you know we are essentially we've got there's now a generation who will you know uh, you know from a health perspective will be going in you know will will if they don't change their activity habits are likely to become a huge burden on on health the health sector and you know there is an opportunity to take action now and prevent what is potentially a you know an, an, an uh, something that could be you know really quite challenging for for our society but ev- everybody you talk to probably would get that you know, even if somebody was listening to this podcast, it's unlikely somebody's listening to this podcast that isn't in sport. But let's just imagine somebody is by pure chance. They're still going to get that as an argument, aren't they? Yeah, actually, physically active kids are going to be healthier and therefore that's going to be good for society, et cetera, et cetera. And yet it can't, it doesn't reach policy. It's it's quite fascinating. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There's there's probably a whole there's probably a whole discussion around that as well, isn't there? Around you know what's uh, what why is that why does that happen? I, I, I'm reading the um, uh, start with why book at the moment. Oh, brilliant! Yeah, great. And that talks about uh, one of the, the the bit that I'm listening to at the moment is talking about Martin Luther King and how you know how he sort of inspired people because you know he was the why he was the why you know he he sort of represented the why to so many people. Um, yeah. around the civil rights movement of course but there was another chap who i've forgotten his name who implemented it and made sure that the made sure that the once everybody's inspired for these things to happen then the policy went through as well yeah, yeah. and so for all the why you need the why and you need all the sort of you know mm. the, the passionate motivation and inspiration but behind that you need people doing the what and the how absolutely um yeah, he said. Isn't it, I think he in that book, uh, Simon Sinek, isn't it? He says, uh, you know, he, he he said, "I have a dream, not I have a plan." Yeah, <laughs> twelve point action plan. Yeah, <laughs> quite the same. <laughs> not quite the same, is it? Yeah, yeah. Actually, uh, there's a uh, there was a great movie I've just watched recently as well called Marshall, which was about the civil rights time and kind of a, an example of lawyers essentially going out there challenging cases in order to bring about that kind of whole civil rights act and bring it into bring it into reality and like you say there's a lot you know the, the what and the how does have to still be implemented you can't purely just have the dream can you? you still have to do what you need to do but the point being is that selling that why is the reason people engage in the first place isn't it yeah it's yeah it's yeah I'm actually, funnily enough, I've just started uh, the audio book of his follow-up, which is Finding Your Why. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. yeah. Which, yeah, so I'm kind of getting into that because I think that he sort of tackles then the whole thing. I think, like you say, I think finding the why is actually quite challenging for a lot of people. In fact, I'm speaking tomorrow at an event um, with NHS England uh, talking about um, – physical activity and sport but also then talking about some of the methods in which sports people can manage change and 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 tackle and and think about their mindset and how they can tackle these different challenges and what have you uh, because as you can imagine nhs is, uh, is is constantly going through processes of change and managing change is quite a challenge but it's interesting how um within that context i talk about things like leadership and and, and approaches and cinex got some fantastic stuff on leadership and he talks about how um you know, the, the kind of whole idea of when you have a really fantastic culture, and this resonates, I think, within the sports context, you have a really fantastic culture. It's like being in a family in the sense that, you know, no one's, you know, you can come, I can, I can have a, a go at, you know, my brother and, you know, and we can have a fight and this, that and the other. But if you come and have a fight with my brother, then you're in trouble. You know, and we're going to back each other up and support each other all the way. And that sense of family being really important to the to the development of culture. And I think that's an interesting dynamic in terms of whether we in that kind of coaching community have that sense yet. I think I feel like it's growing, but it's taking a while. Yeah, that's another fascinating one for me because um, there is a lot around that. I don't think a lot of people think why when they when they're talking about sport because because it's something especially people who are spreading the gospel yeah it, it's something that is intrinsic in you so you don't necessarily think about why mm. from the perspective of someone who's not embedded within whatever sport it is that you're coaching 
Mm. And you do hear that language around. I, I do think it's a bit of a, a strange thing sometimes when we're talking about how, you know, okay, well, how, especially in cricket in Scotland, it's, it's a small sport, always pushing, trying to grow the sport. But it, some of the language around it, it's almost like um, drug dealers, you know, because you're saying things like, oh, you know, we've got to get them early and, you know, we got to give them some, not, the first one's free and, you know, we'll get them in and we'll do some free stuff with them and then we'll, and then we'll get them hooked. And I don't, sometimes I think, is that the way that you want to be approaching? I mean, I haven't got any answers to this. Don't, don't think that I'm, you know, I'm preaching with this great solution to all this. I'm not even sure if it's right or wrong, but I do sometimes think to myself that kind of language and that kind of of approach is kind of missing the point sometimes. And is there some way of tapping into that uh, more intrinsic motivation of people rather than trying to sort of get them hooked on the drug of your sport? Yeah, totally. Uh, uh, and when you say hooked on the drug, you mean the kind of the drug of the experience. So you think, are you talking about having almost like a, a deeper motivation to participate than, than just being kind of like you say hooked, it's not hooked. It's kind of love. You love it. You're not hooked to it, addicted to it. You love it. And it's a different concept. Is that kind of where you're coming from? Yeah. It's sort of, you got to do it. It's a chore. It's something that you have to do because, Oh, you know, it's, it's, you know, I have to do, I've, my mum said I have to do some after school club and I guess cricket's the least worst one. <laughs> do that but I, I can't wait to get back to my uh playstation what's interesting though is my you know my little boy like you know he, he likes to he's on his xbox playing his Fortnite and stuff like that. he's really into it he loves being there he, he loves getting online with his mates they're chatting away he has a wonderful time he's in his own little world it's fine great uh he's self-aware enough to know he's not doing too much he knows not to push the, push the envelope um but he loves his cricket loves it you know if i tell him he can't if you know if let's say behaves in, incorrectly it doesn't happen very often but if he does and i tell him he can't go to cricket that's the worst thing in the world for him hmm. and uh, and I, I sort of say to him you know what 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 is it about cricket and he's like um i don't know he says i just i love i love hitting the ball i love bowling i love you know, he just he just loves the whole challenge of the whole environment of it all. And interestingly enough, you know, he's been involved with hockey with me for quite some years, some time, some time. And uh, this year I said to him, look, you know, why don't you do another sport? Do some rugby, uh, you know, because the rugby club's just literally down the end of the road, more or less. Mm. And he's gone along for his first session. He's come back. He's absolutely buzzing. He loves it. Oh, he's mad. Brilliant. I learned to tackle, you know, and he was a bit worried about that because he's joined it quite late. He's 11 and most of the kids have been tackling, you know, full contact more or less for a couple of years now yeah. so he's a bit worried about that and they showed him how to tackle a little bit you know they kind of walked him through it and all that sort of stuff slightly concerning for me anyway but anyway they, um, uh, but you know he's playing these games and they're learning to tackle and he said oh, yeah, I loved it I loved it and he played a bit at school but not not just tag not tackle and um, you know and again you know that's a good example of you know I think he's come back with this oh it's brilliant you know really into it now will, time will tell when it's freezing cold and frosty or, or wet and sodden and he's out there because they play game after game after game after game you know i wonder in the depths of winter whether he'll still be into it but you know, it remains to be seen let's see how he gets on but it's great to see that he's, he's involved i'm slightly got to i've got to admit i have to say to my wife i've said to my wife i'm really bought into you know multi-sport lots of opportunities this that, and the other but there is a little part of me that was slightly gutted at how much he loved it <laughs> <laughs> i'll be honest with you <laughs> but anyway I, to be honest if that's where he wants to go and he wants to enjoy it I do I just want him to enjoy sport I want him to have a great time you know I'm not I'm not as bothered that he doesn't have to be involved in hockey because to be honest I've got to a point in, with hockey where it's almost becoming a little bit too monotonous as well um, and funnily enough interestingly enough from the from the from the in, in, from a coaching perspective my enjoyment has definitely come more from cricket this year than it has from hockey and that's largely because uh, it's kind of a it's, it's, it's a new realm so there's lots more exploration for me so it's still that I've got that whole you know, landscape. That's not to say I haven't got as much exploration to be done in hockey and there's still work to me, for me to be done. But by no means am I anywhere near, you know, fully proficient in what I'm trying to do. It's just that cricket is kind of very new and I, so, uh, uh, 
in terms of the it, it presents a different cognitive challenge yeah because of the nature of the game the dynamics are different you know game based activities game game based you know with, with multiple dynamics lend themselves to that kind of game form and that and that method methodology more readily whereas the dynamics of cricket where individuals are at play you know it makes it really quite challenging to be able to ecologically develop a group of individuals and give them enough time when there's a lot of them if that makes sense yeah 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 and because it, you know the sport does take a long time even a short game takes a long time mm-hmm. um i don't know if talking about the hundred is is uh, something that we want to be doing about now but that you know even that even the hundred which is the newest fastest format that there is mm. you know still you're talking about a, a couple of hours uh, of, of of the sport and you might only have two balls you know if you play the game as the game you might only you might only face two balls when you're batting and that's it for you you know that's it thanks very much you know go and go and field for an hour and 45 minutes so it's um yeah there's a lot of challenges around the way that the game structures isn't there that that, that make i think also lend it towards drills which is um uh, i know something that you've uh, you've talked about a lot so we probably don't want to go down that road again but it lends because you can go oh well, i can get a lot of volume in in a very short amount of time yeah um you know let's 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 go down that road and so it's uh i can understand why there's a lot of you know especially with fielding you know there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff around fielding drills where you know you're you know you're you're all lined up and just waiting to take a catch each and that you know there are there are better ways of doing it than that of course but um yeah i think i think you you have to do stuff like that otherwise you're just not going to have you're just not going to have the time on the task when you are if you're just playing games all the time yeah you don't get the reps do you so there's yeah. a, you have to sacrifice representativeness in order to be able to give people enough reps to be able to have enough experiences of what's likely to happen in the game i still think that it's so I think it lends itself to that, but I think the challenge for me is to find the balance point. Continuously, the mm. challenge for me is to find the balance point. And because I lean further to the uh, that that ecological space, you know, I'm usually creating game challenges for individ- for the for the players to experience. Mm and drawing out those learning moments because I, I want to present them with the problems the game is going to present to them as much as I possibly can so they're learning to be to play cricket or to learning to be cricket to play the game of cricket rather than learning the kind of techniques of cricket and the sacrifice is they don't get the reps uh, but I think I feel like that at this point that that's the important thing to do is because um whilst they are technically deficient what they are doing is developing a game appreciation and an understanding of a ways of achieving within the game that, that are different um but i always come away from sessions thinking i don't know if they got enough goes i don't know if they got enough um enough input you know in terms of you know enough kind of a, a sort of uh you know kind of ass- assistance i suppose to be able to solve the problems did they recognize some of the problems and explore alternative solutions or did they literally just try and do what they always did to you know with with uh, the same amount of success i just don't know and that's my constant uh question in my mind you know yeah. have i got the balance point right that's right. Yeah. I was talking about this, this, this morning to somebody, it was a one-to-one situation. So we could do a lot more reflection and exploring around things. Obviously you can't do it when you've got a, you know, a group of 30 kids standing in front of you or whatever it is. But you know, I was, I was saying to the, cause he, he was having a very specific problem that he was getting frustrated with. And I, I, we were trying to explore uh, ways of, of solving that problem. And I said, and, and I said, you know, how, what do you think? What, what can we do here? And he said, Oh, I'm just going to keep trying. And I said to him, well, there are times when keeping trying will get you through, but also, you know, you're, you're punching a brick wall sometimes. Yeah. And eventually, if you punch that brick wall enough, you will get through it. Um, it'll take a long time. But if you look just a little bit to your right, you might see there's a door there. Yeah. So, you know, why, why are you spending all that time punching the wall when all you have to do is move two feet to your right and go through the door? Yeah. So, so and that that's easy when you're in a one-to-one situation but yeah if you can find a way to recreate that on with with larger groups um of kids where they are just experimenting with 
ways of trying to achieve something. I think that's, I think you're going, going in the right direction there. And, and the number of goes is less important then because you're almost sort of, you're eliminating things as, as well as, as adding things as you go and, 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 and working with things. Well, it goes, I, back, I think, it goes back to quality, doesn't it? So it's quality reps. Um, yeah. So I think, yeah, yeah. you know, it is a hundred low, low quality, low representative reps better than 10 really representative reps. <laughs> yeah. I don't, I don't yeah, know the answer. There's no way of measuring that. No. Well, actually, well, yeah. I mean, there's, there's a lot of sort of ifs there, isn't there? Um, I, I, I've said it before in that um, if you hit, if you hit 500 balls on the bowling machine, um, that's all in you know, the machine set to put the ball in the same place 500 times and you hit the ball 500 times at the end of that, you're going to be better at hitting the ball from the bowling machine for sure. Yeah. But the bowl, the, you don't have a bowling machine in a game. Yeah. So is it, is it, is there a crossover there to when you get exactly the same ball in a game situation when you've got other things going on at the same time? So yeah, there is that on one level you're thinking great volume, volume is the, is the answer here. But on the other level is, well, can we, can we stress test that rather than just re- repeat, 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 repeat? And, and um, the more you do it, the better you get. It isn't necessarily the case, is it? No, definitely not. And my, um, I suppose, uh, hypothesis that I'm sort of, I guess, daily testing almost with that is, is that I actually feel that those kinds of learning approaches are actually counterproductive. Now, that, what, what do I mean? What do I mean by that? Well, so it, what I mean is that, um, or they can, sorry, they can be counterproductive to qualify that statement. Yeah. What I mean is, is that they, they lull the learner into a state of mental numbness. So the only thing that needs to be done is to move in the same way over and over and over again. So to a certain extent, then, you know, you don't really need to engage uh, mentally within the process. And all you need to do is essentially perform the same movement pattern. So you become almost desensitized to things that are happening. Not quite. I, I, I'm taking, you know, because even, even with a bowling machine, there's a degree of variability. But mm. the bowling machine is designed very much to create, you know, the same delivery, the sort of thing you don't get from a bowler. Correct. Right. So um, it has its uses in that respect. But you have to understand what that purpose is. So what a lot of people think they think it's to do is develop skill. No, it's not to develop skill. It's to develop technique. But we have to understand that technique and skill are two very different things because skill is, is technique applied in context. So mm-hmm. if you want to develop skill, you need to use a different methodology. Now, the assumption is if we develop technique, we can then apply that in, in context. And, and fair enough, that, that may apply. But that's only based on an, an ideal set of circumstances. So if the ball is delivered at that speed from that height um, into that area, you probably will be proficient at that shot. What you won't no, be proficient... I might even you, argue with that, but... You, you might. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 You well. might be proficient at that shot. But... Um, uh, but how often are those ideal set of circumstances going to present themselves? Because you have different bowlers bowling diff- from different heights, from different places, you know, different places on the crease, using different deliveries almost every ball if they can. The ball rarely arrives at that particular point. So you have to make a lot of decisions as a batsman. You know, and it, the minute you remove the decision-making component or reduce the decision-making component, you have to understand that you are reducing the capability of the individual to be able to make those micro adaptations. And I believe what marks out the great from the good is the ability to micro adapt. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I think that's I think that's a a question that's worth exploring. I think I think you're right. It's you know having those having that flexibility instead of being having having a, a database of ans- of perfect answers and all you need to do is select the right one. Mm. Uh, you you have to be a bit more um, flexible, don't you? And the, of course, the other thing a bowling machine um, can't do is it can't be a it can't be a bowler. It can't um, you can't see what the bowler is doing. Mm. And one of the big ways, especially at higher levels, one of the big ways that um, batsmen get their um, 
ability to pick the line and length of, of the bowling is from the bowling action of the bowler and you lose all that from the bowling, which just pops out of the hole, doesn't it? So it's, it's a, it's a very different experience. And actually I say to guys, look, it will feel faster than it is because you've lost all of the, you've lost all of the clues of what's going to happen before the ball just pops out of a hole at whatever speed it pops out of a hole at. So, you know, at 60 miles an hour, it doesn't feel that bad at 70 miles an hour. It starts to feel a bit quicker than you thought 70 miles an hour would would feel (laughs) at 80 miles an hour. It feels a lot faster than 80 miles an hour feels. So (laughs) it's definitely, it it, it definitely is different. And if it's different, then how much of a crossover are you going to get? That's why I like the sidearm, you know, the, I mean, it's a terrible named product, but it's a brilliant product. It's a, you know, it's a, a, a ball throw, that you, same as you get for dogs, except it's a uh, reinforced uh, material. So you can throw a cricket ball with it instead of a, instead of a tennis ball. Mm. And uh, I've, in fact, I've, I'm working with some people for the first time this winter and they, they we were talking about the equipment that they've got and they said, oh, we've got a bowling machine, but I, think it's, I, I don't think it's working. I think it's broken. I said, that's great. Don't worry about paying to get it fixed. Just buy ten sidearms, yeah. and we'll teach all the kids how to throw the ball with the sidearm. Yeah, and then and that will be so much better than anything anything a bowling machine for, can do. From my perspective, of you getting all the clues of the, as long as you get the person sort of, you know, running or walking in, and then sort of recreating a bowling action with it rather than uh, rather than just sort of standing and flicking it, then you're um you, you the club's quids in because it saved you know five hundred mm-hmm. quid. And uh, the kids have got an extra skill because they're all learning to throw with the sidearm and they're all getting closer experience to facing a bowler. So it, it's still, it's for winning. me, it's still, um, obviously there's still, there are still limitations with that particular thing. But like you say, it is more representative and gives you the kind of reps that you're looking for. Because often uh, one of the other challenges, isn't there, is you're rarely facing somebody who can deliver the ball at that kind of pace, whereas the old, old dog thrower can properly generate some proper pace without that individual being physically tired as quickly as they would do from bowling oh, yeah. that number of deliveries. Yeah, correct. Yeah, yeah. oh yeah. Yeah, I mean, I can throw down over 100, uh, well over 100 balls an hour um, with it and do it that for three or four hours if I, if I need to mm. and be fine the next day. Whereas if I tried to bowl... You know, if I tried to bowl 300 balls in a day, I'd, well, my arm would be hanging off. So <laughs> it's definitely, uh, and I couldn't do it at the speed that it does it either. So it's definitely a, a big boon for me. Cool. Not that I'm a, you know, suddenly I've become a salesman for that product, but it's, uh, it, I, I do, I, it has revolutionized the, the way that I coach, definitely. I've definitely, I've seen a lot of them around, to be fair. Um, it's a good okay. skill. Well, sorry, we've just got, we've gone on, we haven't, I think we've only covered item one on your list. <laughs> <laughs> no, we've covered a few things, actually. We have covered a few things. And, right, what's next? Well, actually, it does lead in quite nicely into the next one, which is, we, we, you know, we're talking about getting um, time to, to, to develop. Uh, what we've done this year in Scotland is uh, adopt the Australian um, recommendations for uh, youth cricket in that we've changed a lot of the way that it's played so it's a bit less like in that inverted commas proper cricket and it's it's giving people more opportunities to participate mm. so it's things i mean obvious things which should have been done years ago which is like making the pitches smaller for, mm. for for younger people and um making the uh the boundaries shorter as well as another one so you know there's 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 obvious things like that which are brilliant but the the one for me is that if you there's fewer players in the team and also you get a much better chance of having a bat because if you um it's pairs cricket to start with so you definitely get a bat at under 12 level mm-hmm. and then when you get to under 14 level um you have to retire after i think it's 20 balls Right. So, um, you, you're out, if you're out, you're out. So yeah. you can have, you know, there's still that risk of, you know, of, of only having to face one ball and then that's you. But, um, if you, what it means is that the better players can't just totally dominate from beginning to end, you know, cause you bet you, in the old days, you put your best two batsmen in and they'd bat all the way through and then no, and then all you'd get to do all that. And then you wouldn't get to bowl either. That's the other thing. Everyone has to bowl in that, at that level. Um, 
the other you wouldn't get to bowl either and then you get just you lucky you you get to stand in a field for an hour and a half while everybody else gets the glory yeah so um I, I, that that experiment with sort of more developmental things and participation things has got some people up in arms as well because you know there's still the uh, you know we should be playing to win and we should be fielding our strongest team and we should be making sure our best players are, are doing the things at the best time and it's not helping the best players because everyone has to have a go and that's not helping the best players get better because they you know they they only get 20 balls and then they've got to stop and uh, that's not helping the best players. So I was interested in, first of all, h- how much have you seen of these new formats uh, and what do you think of them? And also, you know, wh- where, where, is that, where is that line? Because there is always a line between trying to develop people and trying to win. Uh, but, you know, where, where does that all fit in? I, I did. I did um, so uh, a lot of sports have embraced the concept of um, making changes to their youth format in order to uh, provide young people with a better experience, I think, as a starting point. And then I think also part of it is to um, somehow represent the game um, from the perspective of the child um, and therefore actually from a, I think, a you know, kind of a skill development perspective, they you know so for example i know in australia they made changes to the system because they thought because because they basically with wrench in renshaw's help mm. um said that with a shorter pitch the ball gets delivered at a trajectory that is more like a trajectory that you're likely to face as an adult as in it comes in flatter as opposed to when you play on a longer pitch you know surprise surprise 11 year old the ball goes up and then comes down you know because they just can't get the ball over that that, that distance yeah so that makes total sense um and you know, and in, for example, in in my time in rugby, we made quite a lot of changes to the youth system in terms of actually kind of um, bringing in elements of the game over a period of time, over a set a period of years. So, you know, you go from playing tag to playing, um, and just playing touch to playing tag, and then you know you bring in tackling, and then you bring in. Uh, you know kind of rooks and then you bring in malls and then you bring in elements you know prior to that it used to be you basically you know you did a little bit of tackling and then next thing is you you play in this game with everything involved it's seven aside but there's everything and basically the the ball gets stuck in a mall it doesn't come out for about five minutes and then the game's over and you know so changing it actually just makes the sports experience far better and then also represents the kind of game actions that the performers are likely to see as they as they uh, develop and, and move forward and there's loads of examples of that. Uh, football have done the same, you know, min- reducing numbers and things like that. Um, but every single time anyone does this, first and foremost, experiences within the sports are just fascinating. Around, um, y- you would think that some of the de- some of the decision makers, uh, you know, within you know, for example, you know, a sports governing body councils or you know, kind of where you have to go to to make these changes. You know, in, in a rugby context, you would think we were suggesting that they should play with a round ball. It was honestly, it was like you you, you were tearing at the fabric of the sport. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, you know, at, uh, at elite levels, they make changes to the rules, to the, to the laws. Sorry, not rules, laws. You know, yeah. every 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 almost every year for the purposes of either safety or television or whatever it might be. But in youth, in youth rugby, apparently we've got to retain the authenticity. So the actual challenge of actually getting the decisions made internally is significant anyway. And then you take it out into the marketplace and, and you get, you get a lot of opposition, you know, Oh, you know, it's gone soft or whatever it might be. Um, but, you also get some really, really strong advocates and then you get a movement and then it grows. What you've described hasn't reached me yet. Now, I know that the ECB, um, because I sat down with a couple of their guys uh, a year or so ago, were working on changes to the youth system. It sounds to me like Scottish cricket are ahead of the game in terms of bringing that forward bringing that through. But that model you've described sounds a fantastic game format. I mean, we are under 11s at the moment have a development league and a um, strong, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? There's like a development league and a kind of under, they call it under 11s and then under 11s super eights. And the super eights, like a development league, it's eight aside and it's pairs cricket and everybody bowls four overs, everybody 
you know, every bats are four overs, every bowls two overs, and you know, and, and same thing, pairs cricket. Uh, the under 11s though is 20 overs, you're out, you're out. Um, with yeah. retire, we retire at 25, I think it's retire at 25 or something like that. So that model you've described, which is retire after 20 balls, regardless of how many runs you've scored, that's a really good idea because, like you say, that gets a lot more people in bat, and 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 it's a much better experience for everybody. Yeah, well, I, I think the, certainly the the feedback um, from the kids has been fantastic. You know, there, there's not been that 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 same argument from the kids of saying, "Oh, actually, no, we just want to win the game." You know, I'd rather not. I'd rather not have rather not bat if we win the game because you know I want us just to go out and win everything. But there is certainly an, an element of the coaches who are saying. Well, you know, we, we're trying to develop these some of these guys into um, first team club cricketers, uh, rep level cricketers, mm. uh, international cricketers. So, uh, you know, that that process has got to start somewhere. So, you know, stopping them from being able to do that is not is not helping. Mm. And then we've still got a little bit, although that model has been sort of impressed across the whole country by, you know, centrally by Cricket Scotland, which is brilliant. So, you know, wherever you go in the country, it's exactly the same. So there's yeah. no mucking about with different types of wides or anything like that. It's all, but it's exactly the same. Brilliant. So um, it, there is still a layer of, at the end of the season, right, we've got the top, we've got the top, uh, four teams here so we're going to have a, a playoff day we're going to have uh, two semi-finals uh, at a final and then um, whoever wins that is the best team <laughs> and so that I think that layer there is is interesting and, and I don't know what the answer is there whether you which which way you go with it whether you say but well, actually you know that's not the point of this the, the whole point of this now is is participation and development. We want to get as many people playing cricket and actually playing, not just standing in a field watching the best players play. Mm. Um, so do we need that? Do we need that? Oh, we've got to have a champion. The, we've got to have the 2018 champion of the under-14s league. Otherwise, the whole thing is pointless. Or do we? Is that's the one way of doing it? Or is the other way of doing it saying, we, the whole season we focus on on participation and development but then the ones who do happen to be the best four then we have you know then we make it more of a competitive thing and we forget about the you know all the all the particip- participation rules and we just go for a you know a game of you know quote unquote proper cricket so what what i'm hearing you saying though is that they've got this like developmental philosophy that comes into the game to change the change the sports experience for the young people so it's more yep. about them developing and learning and this that and the other and then you kind of ruin it all by throwing on serious competition which kind of like you know basically says completely the opposite to kids it's actually about outcomes and winning and losing and then that kind of and is that is that being driven locally by organisations locally who don't know any better, or is that being driven nationally? Yeah, we have the, the leagues will, will run the um, will run the tournament, mm. but the rules of the tournament are passed on from the governing body. So yeah, you've got this sort of slight imbalance, I suppose, with the league still in this way of doing things, which has always been, which is you have you know you have a league, and then you have a uh, some kind of a fi- final and then you can announce a winner you can put it onto the website and say this is the best under uh, 14 team of the year yeah a good friend of mine uh, i say a good friend of mine um uh anyway he's a good friend of mine to be fair um he he, he might not be he might not think the same way because he used to work for me when i was <laughs> in rugby he now works um in works for one of the rugby academies and he recently uh, had a um challenging time because he challenged uh, a particular club um, who had posted on social media that they'd won I think they're under 15s maybe who it was you know they'd won 86 86 four and he kind of reminded them about the experience that people might have had out of that and that there was actually some regulations that suggest that at half time if you're winning more than 50 nil you should you know make changes to your teams to rebalance the you know and, and, and all that sort of stuff and it caused quite a stink and caused him quite a lot of challenges and this, that, and the other. And 
it's very difficult, isn't it, within that sports context to get people to understand the difference between uh, competing and w- uh, competing and winning, mm. and the focus being on competition. So when you talk about competition, people go, "Oh yeah, about winning, winning and losing, and and tournaments and and formal competition," but that's very different from competing. So you want kids to compete and you want them to have a great game, but um, if they uh, if it becomes all about the outcome, the winning, the winning element, the outcome of the competition, then you lose the competing piece. You're just focused on the outcome at whatever, whatever, whatever costs. So the learning element and the developmental element immediately has to become sacrificed in some way. You're learning about different things, which is how to get to the outcome as opposed to how to, how to, how to uh, you know compete against the opponent with a view to obtaining an outcome and that sounds like a semantic difference but I think it's quite an important distinction for people to get to get their heads around yeah it is and I, although I don't think any of that apply this maybe this is my personal bias coming out but I don't think any of that applies is if you're not getting your chance because you you're you're playing a format where someone where two or three people can dominate when you're playing in a team of eight, nine, ten, or eleven, so yeah, yeah, that, that, that's it doesn't sort of matter then, does it? Yeah, yeah, that's my point. You 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 begin to sacrifice competing for the purposes of the outcome. So coaches begin yeah. to make the minute you start to layer on elements that focus you more. So like a league, a cup, a shield, elements that now become more focused on outcome. So we've now begun to place more emphasis on outcome than competition uh, or competing then that changes behavior. So coaches then begin to act in different ways. And then competition organizers bring in rules like we have rules in our league saying, if you've opened the bowling, you're not allowed to open the batting. Now, that's no, that would be normal to me. I would never have somebody who's opened the bowling opening the batting. Yeah. But lots of teams do. Why? Because they want the outcome. And they know yeah. that actually they can actually win a league with four really good players and seven fielders. <laughs> yeah yeah and and that's the thing i guess as well is that you can't really you can't how, how do you say at the end of the year you know if, if someone says well how did you do and you say oh it was great you know everybody uh, had a really good experience they all really enjoyed it you know we've we've retained everybody for next year um you say all that kind of thing and they say great but you know how, how do we do you know how many wins do we get did we, you know how 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 good are we going to be next year if you know how good are the under 16s going to be next year because we know the under 14s are really good because they got to the to the uh, finals day so um, yeah i got it's, that it's a constant challenge isn't it i got that well th- this is the problem with having things like leagues i mean why not just have matches let's have a match let's compete against each other and let's see how we get on but then you put leagues in and all of a sudden that becomes the focal point i had parents at the end of the season some coming up to me saying oh yeah how did we do in the league i said do you know what i never sent the scores in he looked at me like i'd gone crazy <laughs> so I didn't send the scores in why not we could have we could have won that league i said yeah i know but i don't care kids don't kids haven't asked me once where we are in the league, not once. Haven't, yeah. asked, haven't asked me, uh, you know, uh, who's got the most runs. Haven't asked me any of that. They've li- literally, we've rocked up, played matches, gone home, had a, had a good time, and I'm not putting any emphasis on any of that other stuff. That can come in, that can come in later, maybe. Maybe when it becomes, you know, if, if they want to learn to be more, if they want to become more involved in that kind of formal competitive stuff and the outcome, perhaps. But, you know, the 11 year olds, we're going to stay focused on playing games of cricket they're learning opportunities aren't they really yeah 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 uh, uh, and also we are funneling towards um competition in that sense of the having a league because there are you know the senior teams have leagues and then you've got representative level teams above that who compete against each other and then you've got people playing for scotland and competing with other countries so you are funneling towards something and like you said it's how do you build that into a into a structure is isn't it is a good question as well isn't it because you don't want to um 
you don't want to have nothing, nothing, nothing. And then, oh, we're going to go play senior cricket now. And then, you know, we're in a, we're in a league because that's a different experience. Then it becomes a different experience. Mm-hmm. So you want to, how do you funnel, how do you funnel that? It's an interesting question to me as well. I think, I think the, the way that it's structured here is, does, it does kind of work, but it means at under 16 level, you are playing in a league, you're playing 2020 cricket, all, you know, all the normal 2020 cricket rules. Mm. Um, but then, uh, is that maybe a bit too, is that still maybe a bit too young, but it is for some and it isn't for some. So <laughs> I guess I'm answering my own question there and saying it's just massively complicated and there's no simple answer. Yeah, I know. And, and what, what I think, um, where I think a lot of, um, sports governing bodies tend to go wrong slightly is what they tend to do is they actually take quite a linear approach to competition creation as well so um and they tend to think of it in the sense of age group cricket so you're in an age and of a certain age you get a certain this is a format you're going to play in this age and this is a format you're going to play in this age and this is a format you're going to play in this age all great if you're the average player Mm. but if you're developmentally immature you know either physically or uh you know kind of psychologically then that might not be the format for you but you're that age so therefore you have to play that format yeah. and likewise you might be you know your training age might be very very young in the sense that you've only come to the game late but now all of a sudden you know so if, if a brand new brand new to cricket 11 year old came to me next year um you know, and they're at a certain age at school, then there's a format for them, which is that kind of 20 over game when, you know, uh, you're out, you're out. And they go into that game of cricket, get first ball, get bowled, you know, bowl a load of wides. That's not much fun for anybody, is it? So what I want to be able to do is to say, actually, there's a format for you. You might be 11 years old, but you're relatively new to the game. So we're going to play this pairs format, which is actually um, gives you much more goes, gets you to learn the game and all that sort of stuff. Not available. Yeah. Yeah, and is there an answer to that? Really, uh, uh, I don't know if there is. Because... Well, you, uh, it's not beyond the realms of possibility, isn't it? Within cricket, because you don't have rugby's more challenging, perhaps because sometimes you've got this size differentials based on age. Yeah, still think it's not impossible because you do get enormous kids who are young, and you get tiny kids who are, who are old, and they all have to play together. And I sort of I understand there are positives and benefit, uh, positives and negatives to that. But in cricket, you don't have as much of that physical confrontation. In, apart from you know very very big boys or big 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 girls who can bowl fast and you know sometimes that's very difficult from a young player a little player. But so what my point being is is that I want to be able to say right I reckon you're at this stage of your development or you know physically or technically or whatever it might be and so that's the game form for you and there's a competitive format for you now and for you right you need something that's a bit in the middle and you right there's a probably slightly more advanced game that you can probably manage go and play that game and be able to flexibly move players between those different formats yeah i don't understand why you can't have like a three format offer at every age group well the the reason i think that's what um we're heading towards mm. in scotland certainly because they've not even although they've given them age on this um on this year they've also given them stage as well oh, okay great so just one two and three and i feel like we're moving towards saying well look you, you just put them in whatever stage you feel is appropriate for that particular person mm. um the problem, of course, is at the moment that you say, yeah, that's great. You know, we're looking at it from a participation and de- development point of view. You're going to put someone in the, the correct stage to help them develop the best. Mm-hmm. But also, we're having a finals day. So let's just c- chuck a couple of the better ones in there as well, just to make sure we get to the finals day. But that, that's, that's, a, that's where you're... That's, yeah. that's where you're um, that's where it's difficult when you get that conf- that point of conflict between trying to win and and trying to develop the whole the whole idea of of, of somebody playing cricket at the right level that that's why my idea falls down because yeah. there will be some people when we layer in some competitive formats uh, sorry some like leagues and cups and shields and the likes who now begin focused on that start to game the system in order to gain an advantage and so start to put more advanced players into the less advanced format to play against you know others who are less advanced 
and as a result then you know kind of stack the deck in their favor which is not the ideal so the the reason people don't do these sorts of things is because uh of those possible situations taking place and and that's yeah. what so what happens is people legislate against it and say you can't do that because people can't be trusted to act in accordance with you know common sense approaches i actually think people can generally speaking and the abuses are minor and they happen periodically but actually if you change the environment to come back to you know an ecological theme if you like if you change the environment then people act and behave in different ways and i've seen it before my very eyes i've seen people playing in festivals where everybody gets the same number of games and we don't re- and we record the scores of the games but there's no you know winners losers semi-finals finals this that and the other i've seen how people behave on those days and i've seen how people behave in tournaments where there's, sh- there's semis semi and i've seen how the kids behave and i've seen how I, I how i feel i have to fight sometimes against my own behavior and i'm aware of this stuff and i've seen how other people behave and it does change it does change and so if you say you know and this is why if i had my if i could be like the youth sport czar You know, I would say, actually, up to this age, we're just going to let kids participate and play against each other. And then they can start to develop, you know, more competitive or add on the competitive layers later on. The problem is, you see, is we're still um, sports are still pretty driven by a talent development mindset. Yeah. Most of the participants you're working with aren't going on to the next stages of representative cricket, but there might be some that do, in which case they want those to be given the experience that's likely to progress them as far as they can go. So everybody gets the same diet. And that's my that's why I feel that you should have these sort of two or three streams at each age group, because yeah. you should have the di- the mixed diet approach, shouldn't you? And you should be able to select different. I mean, I'll have certain players, for example, who I'd put into a different format because it's going to give them a different kind of challenge. And, you know, so the ability side of things, it shouldn't really come into it. You know, we should, I don't know, maybe, maybe it's a pipe dream that will never happen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That is, well, it is a, it's a complicated issue, isn't it? And, and people, you know, it's, is a results driven um thing isn't it sport you know it, it, it may you could argue that it, it perhaps is overly driven by results but it is results driven and you see that at the top end and and you see that filtered down into uh, even the youngest junior end of of almost all sports i suppose apart from you know maybe things like frisbee where um you know they're I, I know a frisbee player. He'd probably be angry at me for saying it. it's more of a pastime, perhaps, than the sport. But do you know what I mean? It's sort of there's when you've got high level professional sport, then that is more likely to filter down, isn't it? So, yeah, but you know, children are not to to, to paraphrase, um, not paraphrase, to quote uh, Richard Bailey: "Children are not mini adults." No, that's right. No, that's and right. They have a right to to play, you know, and not to have adult imposed. Um, you know, kind of ideals of sports participation experiences imposed upon them because, uh, you know, tr- and it goes back to, you know, I always talk about Amanda Visek's work, what, make, what makes sport fun for kids? Winning is 42nd on the list. Yeah. Competing comes higher. It's about 24th or something like that. Competing is up there. Winning is not high on the list. Out of 81 fund determinants, winning is, is right in there in the middle. Way, way more important things, social connection, trying hard achieving things being part of a team you know all those sorts of things are really really important for young people when it comes to their sports experience and we're so busy saying yeah yeah whatever kids it's not about what you want is it we're going to give you stuff that you're you know we're going to give you this stuff that we think you need or we think that you want and and surprise surprise how they walk away from organized sports in their droves not necessarily straight away but but you know after a while no, thank you very much. I mean, I don't know what your what it's like in your club, but certainly in my club, the older it gets, the and the the more the game becomes, you know, resembles the kind of adult game, the, the smaller our numbers get. Yeah. Um, yes. Yes, that is true. That is very true. In fact, the under 18s league, which has been going since your dot. Uh, didn't didn't occur this year because there weren't enough teams to enter into it there you go so you know it stops at under 16 now um the theory being that of course is that you know if if people are if people are still into their cricket at 17 and 18 then you know they're, they're playing senior cricket anyway so cricket. 
yeah. yeah. Yeah, which maybe is slightly different from a uh, sport like rugby, perhaps, where it's it's a bit happens a bit later, does it? I'd... Yeah, you know, you have to play. You can't play adult rugby until you're after until you're older than eighteen. Oh, okay, well there you go. Yeah. Um, but there's a big drop off post eighteen uh, in rugby because right. they play the adult. You know, they've been with their mates having a great time, and then yeah. they go and play with. You know, some of them will go off and play maybe second team, first team, and they'll have a great time. But the ones who go and play third and fourth team, when we asked them, they said. They're a nice bunch of blokes, but it's like playing rugby with my dad. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and the experience changes. So, you know, we looked at things like, you know, can we create something up to 21 or something along those lines so that they can stay together for longer? But then you get the opposition to that, which is, oh, no, but we want some of these players to go into our adult teams. You know, it's a, it's a challenging dimension, like you say. I don't know any, I don't know any hard answers, but I think one of the interesting things is, you know, a lot of organizations, a lot of coaches say, and I ask this question a lot, by the way, you know, I say, I say to them, you know, are you player cent- player centered or athlete centered? And most people are saying yes. And I'm just, I say, no, you're not. And I say, it's not your, it's not your fault. You're not. The environment doesn't allow you to be. It, it's too difficult to be truly athlete centered because so many elements are coming, coming at you left, right and center. You've got parent expectation. You've got all these different leagues and cups and shields and the organizations that are creating these different competitive formats need to think about that, what athlete centered means. And if I would love to see organizations taking those steps to being truly athlete centered in fairness in my, I mean, I was there, so I would, I am my, I am biased, but in fairness to, England, uh, the RFU England rugby, they did make some significant changes to become more athlete centered. I don't, I don't think they'll ever be truly, but they became more athlete centered and they based that on, they put a lot of time and effort into bringing together, you know, um, 15, 16 of some of the world's best academics in, you know, kind of uh, youth sport, talent development to create like a, con- uh, a consensus statement on, these are the things, these are the principles that we want to develop our sport by. And, and they, they pretty stayed pretty tight to that uh, in terms of saying, this is what we're going to base the changes to our sport on. It became a very useful lever for change. Um, like I said, it could always be better. I think there's always going to be outliers out there who value different things, but it's a very, very, it's an interesting way of shifting the sports experience towards a more athlete centered model. Yeah, we we can cross our fingers. <laughs> Keep well, it working. sounds to me like it sounds to me like Scottish. It's early days, isn't it? But it sounds to me like cricket Scotland are moving in the right direction. Yeah, I think they. I, I genuinely think they're trying to. As a chap, he, he's no longer doing it anymore. But uh, he called, called Ian Sandbrook, who came in a few years ago and did some amazing work around participation. But he could only come in because cricket Scotland decided they wanted someone to do something around participation and so they brought in a head of participation and he came in and he just sort of swept the board and said this is what we're doing and you know he brought brought in uh brought in all stars made, built a rela- relationship with ecb to make sure that all stars started which is the, f- the cr- type of cricket for five to eight year olds and he and he um brought in these new junior formats and then he said right that's me i'm done and he left <laughs> so <laughs> but he rev i you know yeah, I met him a couple of times, and he, and he has started a revolution. So I hope, I hope it's going to keep going. I think because cricket is a sport which has slid downhill quite a lot over the last twenty years, particularly in Scotland, I think that it, it sort of needed somebody to say, "Look, if we keep doing what we're doing, we're going to get what we've been getting, which is fewer and fewer people playing cricket every year." Mm. Uh, and since he's done that. I mean, it's only been it's only been one year, but since he's done that, we've we've certainly seen participation levels go up. So um, it's early to say, but it's it looks like it's going in the right direction at least. But it's that's that's the sort of you know anybody who works in sports development, that's the kind of legacy you want, isn't it? Yeah. Um, to uh, but yeah, funnily enough, I think often you find that people like that who are change agents don't stay in roles very long because they're in demand. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, he did. He stirred the pot. He didn't take uh, Aussie, so you know you don't you don't don't take any nonsense, do you? It's interesting that the head of participation at uh, the ECB is also Australian, and did, did, he was you know he created the All Stars concept. But what's interesting is I know I know quite a few people at the ECB who are kind of leading on that, and the approach they took to the coaching to coaching round, saying you know we don't necessarily need uh, for All Stars, we don't necessarily need coaches. What we need is activators who are going to create a great sports experience for kids to allow them to play games and have a good time. And a lot of that came from. Uh, um, there's a uh, uh, a girl who's working there who came from from netball who actually went and studied with Disney around uh, customer experience right. and borrowed from the Disney concept around what the experience for the customer should be like and then started to apply it into the sports concept and um, and that's where some of the ideas around the activator role within All Stars came from which is I think a, a great thing and, and to be commended to be honest. Oh yeah, and it's uh, you know we we did it uh, this year and it's and it's and it's brilliant. I mean, it's 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 definitely not proper cricket. Nowhere nowhere near it. Mm. I'll give you one. I'll give you one story on on how it's and how it's completely different. I think this sums it up completely. So we had a bunch of five to eight year olds all in their all in their all stars kit. First session, um, we had the orange stumps. Yeah, lined up in that game where you you put a bit of string in a circle and then you put the stumps in the middle and they will have a go at throwing trying to throw the balls at the, at the stumps. Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's it's great fun, silly little game, and um, we said three, two, one, go. And one of the kids just um, tore headlong into the cir- circle and dived headfirst through these four sets of stumps. <laughs> 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 so he didn't get the idea but it was so funny that he, you know nobody was you know it wasn't something where he was at, we were angry or anything it's just it just and if something sums up all stars it's that it's like it's just pure fun play without with it's just play, it's just play it, could, it just got this notion right it's, this is what i need to do here I'm, they told me to knock down the stumps I'm knocking down those stumps. Have you seen that brilliant video of that uh, of that guy trying to teach his son to play baseball? And he says, "Keep your eye on the ball." So he like he, he's only like two, and he bends down and that he physically puts his eye on the ball. Have you seen that? Yes, I've like, seen it. It's like that, isn't it? You know, he's come up with his yeah. own solution of how to solve that problem. And, and, and <laughs> I love that. I love the creativity and the ingenuity of children. Yeah, correct. <laughs> and rather than correcting it, you just say, you know, what that's a brilliant idea. You know, maybe, maybe we can use the ball next time, though. How about that? <laughs> yeah, okay. I've got a new rule for you. We've got you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, David, I could talk to you all night. I know you've only got about halfway through your list. Um, sadly, I'm, uh, I'm pressed for time because I've got an alternative engagement that I need to be involved with a club committee meeting, which I certainly would much prefer to have this conversation than that. <laughs> but, um, just, just as a matter of interest, uh, I know you're active, and just for as a reminder for people who may not have seen the first podcast, I know you're actively involved in sharing some of your experiences with others. I know I certainly used your battle zone idea this year, and it went really well. Um, and I tweaked it and amended it and added some bits and pieces just to suit my own context. Um, so, how can people, um, you know, kind of track you down, um, stalk you? troll you or just generally want to ask you questions about some of this stuff the best place at the moment is my website which is david 25.com david 25.com i am i am often on twitter but it, it i don't tend to say too much on twitter um especially during the summer mm-hmm. but uh, i maybe get a little bit busier during the winter when i i've started coming up with some crazy ideas so you can get me on twitter as well as at david hinchliffe um but david 25.com i'm always putting articles up and things up there i've got my own series of podcasts as well which is up on there which i'm not adding to at the moment but um the, the whole idea was it's a little bite-sized 15 minute show about some topic related to coaching cricket so it, it, it's something to listen to on the drive to the ground to get an idea that you can take with you in, into the into that particular session so that's called you are not alone coach so that's still available even though i'm not updating it so um, yeah, david25.com is where you can find me, basically. And uh, if you want to contact me through that, I'm, I'm always happy to chat long into the night about about cricket, being the badger that I am. There's, um, uh, yeah, I mean, so you can you can tell that, for those of you listening, you can tell David's a podcaster because of the silky smooth voice that he has. 
uh, which I'm very jealous of. But also, um, I'm, I'm actually a peer on one of those. Um, You're not alone, yeah, coach, right. on a podcast, one of the early ones. Um, and you were very sensible in limiting me to 15 minutes, as this podcast uh, gives you an example <laughs> of, because I do have the capability of going on long diatribes about particular subjects. Yeah, well, you know, we've got the rest of these these topics to go through. So I've, I've been I've been writing things that have been going as well. So it's it's just never ending cascade of of talking. <laughs> awesome stuff, uh, David. Appreciate it. Love love the conversation as always. Um, uh, yeah, we'll definitely follow up on the list as it comes as it comes uh, in the future. Uh, all the best for your winter, and uh, and you. let's reconnect again maybe in the spring as we begin to uh, start thinking about the next season. Yes, yes. Thank you very much. Go well. <laughs> Cheers, David. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to the Talent Equation podcast. If you like the show, then please consider supporting it by leaving a review on your favorite podcast player, telling your friends about it, or even becoming a hero and show your appreciation by becoming a patron. Just head over to thetalentequation.co.uk and click on the Becoming a Patron button at the top of the page. Kapow. And there you have it. Uh, great to chat again with David. Always fine chatting with him. Really fascinating, really interesting. He's always got some great insights. Often uh, just kind of makes me turn my head to the side ever so slightly on some of the things that I'm talking about. And uh, he's definitely helping me with my my journey in the world of, uh, of cricket and, uh, and using a constraint led approach in the world of cricket. Anyway, um, just uh, just wanted to quickly uh, just wrap up and just say uh, some really good insights in that conversation there with David. He's um, you know he's got a good handle on how we might be able to engage young people, and you know there's so much in there in terms of the way we can provide competition and opportunities for them, and how we can offer them uh, a different a different um, different offer that's more aligned to their abilities and their capabilities, and um, you know it's not an easy thing to do, and so. Um, you know, as I always say to everybody out there, you know, this is this is a journey that we're all on, and I always admire everybody that's prepared to come on here, explore, learn, find new ways, see if we can meet those children's needs in a slightly better way, and uh, and on offer them something that's going to give them an opportunity not only to enjoy their sport but also learn. Um, anyway, uh, hope you enjoyed, uh, and I I wish you all the best with your week of coaching, and I will see you again next week. In the meantime, ditch those drills.